Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hanania High School. I'm Brian Brown, and this will be our sixth and final set of notes related to acid-base chemistry, Chapter 16. Uh, today we'll be looking at Sections 10, dealing with uh, behavior of acids and bases as it relates to structure for substances, and 11, which deals with Lewis acids and bases. Now, when a substance dissolves in water, it may behave as an acid, could behave as a base, or it might exhibit no acid-base properties at all. Really, the question is, which is it going to be, and how strong of an acid or base? Structure of the chemical is really critical to answering these questions. So when we're looking at different substances thrown into water, there are some clues as to whether it's going to behave like an acid or base, and how strong that acid or base is going to be. And that's really what we're looking at here in section 10 of chapter 16. Now, if we're looking at just binary acids, HX acids, so relatively simple binary acids, things with hydrogens on them. Now, the more polar the HX bond and or weaker the HX bond strength, the more acidic the compound is going to be. So remember, this deals with polarizability. If it's a very polar bond, that's going to expose the hydrogen and allow it to be easy, more easily broken off and therefore ionize more. So the more polar the bond or the weaker the bond strength of the substance is really the key to this. Now, a um, couple of general trends here. If you take a look up above, here we've got a chunk of the periodic table. We're looking at two periods on the periodic table, and we're looking at four different groups on the periodic table. Now, as you go across CH4 to NH3 to H2O to HF, You'll notice that CH4, no acid-base properties, NH3 was a weak base, H2O, basically neutral, and then HF is a weak acid. So as you're going across here, it seems there is a general increase in acid strength, especially when you look at period three. No acid-base properties, a weak base, weak acid, strong acid. So there seems to be a general trend across a period of increasing acid strength or and when you're going to the left, increasing base strength. Now, when you go down a group, the, we go from a weak acid to a strong acid in 7A. We go from nothing to a weak acid in 6A. Um, we've got weak, acid, acids, or, I'm sorry, weak bases in 5A and basically no acid base properties in 4A. If we wanted to draw a general conclusion here, it seems like when we look at 6A and 7A, we're getting a stronger acid as we go down. And indeed, that trend within the halogens will continue. HF to HCl to HBr to HI. HI would be the most ionizable and it would therefore be the strongest of that group. Um, within that group, HCl, HCl would be the least ionizable, and it would be the weakest of that group. And if you go back to our old ideas of polarizability, and we're also looking here a little bit at Coulomb's law at times, it should make sense why some of these things are happening. So the more polar the HX bond, and or the weaker the bond strength of that bond, the more acidic it's going to be. Because it's going to be easier uh, to pull off that hydrogen, basically. And as we're going across, that seems to be happening because it's increasing in bond character as we go across. So acidity increases from left to right across a row and increases from top to bottom down a group. Now, these are our simple HX acids. Our, um, Binary substances, so we're talking two elements. One of the elements is hydrogen. That's our general trend and the reason why. Now, if we look at other types of situations like oxy acids, an oxy acid is basically um, a substance with oxygens bonded to it that's acting like an acid. So in oxy acids, in which there is an OH bonded to another atom Y, the more electronegative Y is, the more acidic the acid is. Remember, if you increase the electronegativity, that's going to increase the polarizability. It's going to cause a shift in the electron cloud, exposing that hydrogen. So here's the general idea. The more electronegative it is, that's going to cause a drift in electron density, a shift in electron density towards the more electronegative substance. Well that's dealing with polarizability. It's going to polarize the OH bond when you get that shift in electron density, which means it's going to take less energy to break the hydrogen off of that bond. So snap that hydrogen off, it's going to take less energy. And that's going to cause the H plus to dissociate more easily, creating a stronger acid. So when you look at this group here, HCl, HBr, HIO, so this 
particular set of acids, look at their KAs. And you'll notice, remember, the higher the KA, the stronger the acid is. HClO, HBRO, HIO. The HClO is going to be the strongest acid of the group. Why? Strongest electronegativity. More electronegativity. So if Cl, Br, and I, Cl has the strongest electronegativity, it's going to cause the greatest shift in electron density, which is going to make that OH bond more polarizable, which means it's going to take less energy. Now, this is a series of dominoes falling. You need to explain if you're asked to explain this. You need to get this idea first, and that causes the polarizability, and that means it takes less energy, which means it dissociates more easily. That's the chain of events here. We're really looking at a chain of four dominoes falling that explains how electronegativity ties us to being a stronger acid. Now, for a series of oxy acids, so notice every one of these is chlorine. So it's not about the chlorine being more electronegative. Every one of these acids contains chlorine. Now, this is one of our famous polyatomic ion groups, OCl, and then um, ClO2 and ClO3 and ClO4. This is one when we got into polyatomics in pre-AP chemistry. This was one of the groups we talked about naming. We had hypoite and then ite and then eight and then per eight. So this is a family of polyatomic ions that we've looked at before. Now, for a series of oxy acids, acidity increases with the number of oxygens for the same reason as the last slide. So what you really need to say is the more oxygens you have, the greater the shift in electron density. The more polarizable, the easier it is to pull off that hydrogen. So it's the exact same chain of events. So here we're looking at the more oxygens increasing the polarizability. We're getting it. The more oxygens we get, the greater the shift in electron density away from the hydrogen. That's the key idea here. And this is something that has been on the AP test in the multiple choice, as well as on the FRQ. So it's an idea that you can expect they may ask you for. And these last two ideas were basically the same exact reasoning. Now, one of the largest and most important weak acids, and we talked about this a little bit because it's the type of thing you need to be exposed to it multiple times, is the carboxyl group. This came up in chapter 25. We've already looked at it in class and in notes a couple of times already this chapter. So when you see the COOH group, it's really one of the most important classes of weak acids. You need to recognize that that hydrogen can be removed. Now what's really happening here is the addition of the oxygen bonded to, remember, this is what it looks like here. And what we're talking about is this situation right there. That double bonded oxygen, just like on the last slide, draws the electron density away from the hydrogen, making that hydrogen more polarizable. So it's going to end up making it easier to ionize. And remember, in our equilibrium reaction, our ions are on the right. So that's what the shift equilibrium to the right means. So the addition of the uh, bonded oxygen draws electron density and increases the polarizability of the OH bond, making it acidic. And the greater degree that you do that, the more acidic it can become. So that's one thing that has an effect. Um, another thing that has an effect here is the, rel uh, the resonance that is in the conjugate base of the carboxyl group. So when we pull off the hydrogen, we get the conjugate of that weak acid. So this is the conjugate base of that weak acid. And another factor in this whole idea is that this is now a resonance situation between these two things. And that really stabilizes the base and makes the conjugate acid um, or, and, and makes the situation more acidic, um, and that, which is also going to increase. So basically, if we make one of the products on the right more stable, it's less likely to go in the reverse direction and go back to the old weak acid. And therefore, we're shifting equilibrium to the right. So what we're really doing is affecting the or effectively increasing the concentration on the right side of this equilibrium of one of our substances, that's effectively raising its concentration. That's going to, sh um, or, or, or I should say, it pulls it out of uh, reaction, and that's going to shift equilibrium to the right.
So I would start to say increase concentration of stuff on the right. That would shift to left. That's a different idea. So the second part of this is really that that resonance increases the stability of that base, and it kind of moves it out of it effectively lowering the concentration of that. Um, so we end up with the reverse reaction having less. Now the second one here is one I talked about in class a couple days ago. Besides the carboxyl group, you also need to look for the amine group. The amine group is our important base. The carboxyl group is our important acid group. And you need to understand that the amine group is a substance that can draw hydrogens and therefore it's going to function as a base. So amino acids can basically function as acids or bases depending upon which group is actually active. If it's the carboxyl group that's active, it's going to be acting like a base, so that half of it can act like a base, and the other half of it can, I'm sorry, can act like an acid as that hydrogen comes off on the carboxyl group, and the other half of our amino acid can act like a base. So in one molecule, we have a substance that has a acid like portion and a base like portion. So in this particular reaction between glycine and alanine, when it comes together uh, to basically make a protein, we start with these two different amino acids. Now which of these is going to be um, a stronger acid or a base? So take a look at the pH of glycine in water. pH of glycine in water is 6.0. Is that acidic or basic? Think about it. 6.0 means it's acting as a base. That must, or no, 6.0 means it's more acidic. It's acting like an acid. So that must mean this part of this molecule is more important on that particular situation. So it's acting like a stronger acid. Must be the carboxyl group is dominating. Now, that brings us into, because in this situation we're looking at a hydrogen sticking to potentially to an amine, this is something that um, Bronsted and Lowry would potentially explain one way, but Lewis, and this is the same Lewis guy we talked about before, Lewis Electron Dots, Lewis was a really busy scientist, gave us lots of things to think about and worry about in chemistry. Lewis also had a way to look at acids and bases, and it was a very, very different way than Bronsted Lowry. Bronsted Lowry kind of has the limitation that we're always looking at, you know, an acid reacting with a base. So we have the Bronsted Lowry, the Bronsted uh, base, and then you'd have your conjugate acids and bases. Well, there's some situations that that just doesn't explain why something is acting like an acid. Like why, when you throw it in water, it really makes the water acidic. Sometimes we can't really explain it by bronsted lauer definition. A more general way to look at pretty much any acid-based behavior is Lewitt acid-based behavior. Now, bronsted lauer remember the protons were donors, those things were bases. Um, sorry, proton donors were our acids, so HCl's got a hydrogen, it's a proton that can donate, so that would be an acid, and things that accepted the proton would be a base. So by bronsted lauer definition, this would be our bronsted lauer acid, and this would be our bronsted lowry base. So whatever was giving us that H plus was donating the proton, and NH3 was accepting that proton, so it was a bronsted lowry base. Now, Lewis acids are really defined in a slightly different way. When we look at Lewis acids and bases, what we're going to do is not track the proton. We're going to look at electrons. Remember, this was the electron dot guy and Lewis electron structures. So when we define Lewis acids and bases, we're going to look at Lewis acids as electron pair acceptors. So in this particular case up here, H plus is accepting this electron pair. So H plus is acting like a Lewis acids. So atoms with empty valence orbitals can basically be Lewis acids, one of the most common ones we're going to see. So watch out for this one. So if they're going to ask you on the test, chances are it's going to be a boron compound. Remember, boron is stable with less than a full octet. It can accept an electron pair there. So this is a very common Lewis acid. H plus would be another common way to look at a Lewis acid. Lewis bases would then be the things that donate the electron pair. So anything that could be a bronsted lowry base is really going to be a Lewis base. You're going to end up with the exact same situation. So bronsted lowry bases, Lewis base, um, different way of looking at the exact same situation. But Lewis theory explains why other acids that are out there, which bronsted lowry doesn't really adequately explain, would be considered an acid. Remember a second ago I mentioned, watch for BF3. This is kind of the classic reaction here. We've got ammonia and BF3. Um, 
Lewis acids don't have to be a proton. When we look at this, there's no way to really describe by Bronsted-Lowry theory why this would be acting like acids and bases. But if we look at it from Lewis theory, the NH3 has an electron pair donor. Lewis bases have pair will share. That's a Lewis base. Easy way to remember that. So anything that has a pair of electrons and will share them, that's going to be your Lewis base. And in this case, BF3 is going to be accepting that pair. So this is, remember we talked about this vocab word a few days ago, this is a co coordinate covalent bond situation happening here. The nitrogen is contributing both electrons in that bond. So this is an example of coordinate covalent bonding, which is really common when we're looking at Lewis acid-based theory of getting a coordinate covalent bond situation setting up. So Lewis acids don't have to be a proton. They just have to have empty valence orbitals like H plus and like boron above to accept these. Now remember things that expand octet like sulfur. Things beyond period two can expand octet. Those types of things can also end up uh, being acceptors. So there are a number of things that can do this, but the most common two are H plus and boron. So Lewis bases can interact with things other than protons is really what we're looking at here. So this makes a more generalized situation. Don't confuse Lewis acids with the term acidic. We're looking at different things here. We weren't talking about water chemistry in that Lewis acid-based situation a second ago. We're talking about acidic. We're looking at water solutions. So remember, Bronsted, Lowry, and Arrhenius definitions really deal with water solutions. And the term acidic and basic are appropriate. It's not appropriate when we're looking at Lewis acids unless we're looking at a Lewis acid or base interacting with water, then it would be a potentially an appropriate situation. But remember, in the, the example we looked at, in both examples we looked at, really, water didn't, well, I guess the last one with BF3, it didn't have to involve water. So when you look at this particular situation, we have a reaction that is occurring here. We have this top two species, and they're interacting to make a bottom species here. So we have a starting point and ending point and notice in this case it's interacting with the water. So is this thing going to be acting like a, uh, what's the Lewis acid, what's the Lewis base here? Well, if you track what's happening, Lewis base, have pair, will share. So water here is acting like a Lewis base, which means carbon dioxide is acting like a Lewis acid. So this thing is accepting that pair and H2O is donating that pair. So when we put CO2 in water, we end up making carbonic acid. And that's because CO2 is acting like a Lewis, Lewis acid here. So we can use this to talk about Lewis acid-based theory just a little bit. Now, there is a short video, which I'll post on the document manager. Um, we'll probably also take a quick look at it in class to review the idea. But otherwise, that ends our chapter 16. I hope you learned a ton because there's a lot.